Welcome to CV8 Speaks. My name is David Liston. I am a former chair of Manhattan Community Board 8. I, I am the co-chair of the Health, Seniors, and Social Services Committee. And I am so very pleased to be hosting this episode of CB8 Speaks. Manhattan Community Board 8 serves in an advisory capacity to various city agencies. We represent approximately 230,000 residents of the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. Our district includes the area from 59th Street to 96th Street, Roosevelt Island to Central Park. CB8 Speaks focuses attention and draws information to people about issues of concern and interest to our community. And for that reason tonight, I am so very pleased to have with us two guests from what I consider and many consider to be the most prestigious, prominent uh, district attorney's office in the country, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And tonight we have with us uh, two guests. The first guest will be Rosemary Yu. R Rosemary Yu is the co-chief of the Immigrant Affairs Unit at the Manhattan DA's office. And we'll have the privilege of speaking with her for a while. And then we're going to be joined by Catherine Christian, chief of the Manhattan DA's office's Elder Abuse Unit. Uh, well, thank you so very much for joining us on the show. It's my pleasure. Happy to be here. Um, by way of quick background, if I may, for our viewers, uh, ADA Yu is a native New Yorker. She grew up in Chinatown. Uh, she's been with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office since 2005. She has served in various capacities within the office. Uh, she served with the Office of Special Narcotics, the Special Investigations Bureau, and in the Crime Strategies Unit. Uh, she is one of the founding members of the Prosecutors Committee on Character and Fitness of the Asian American Bar Association here in New York. And in January 23rd, she was selected to serve as co-chairperson of that committee. Uh, she sits on the Committee on Character and Fitness for the New York State Supreme Court, which screens applicants for admission to the bar, and she is the first Asian American to serve on that committee. And so I'm so honored and proud to have her with us. Thank you very much. Why don't we uh, start out by asking you to tell us a little bit about the role of the Immigrant Affairs Unit at the DA's office and your duties and responsibilities as co-chief of the unit. Sure. So the Immigrant Affairs Unit was established in 2007 by Mr. Morgenthau, our prior DA. Um, Mr. Vance, when he came in, enhanced the unit, and now there are two chiefs, myself and Marilyn Rivera. Both of us are native New Yorkers, both of us are from immigrant backgrounds, and both of us have been in the office for quite a long time. Our main responsibilities are twofold. The first is to investigate and prosecute those unscrupulous individuals who target immigrants. The second is to go out into the community and educate the community about fraud against immigrants. Um, so much of our work has to do with building trust within immigrant communities in order for us to successfully protect immigrant communities and for them to trust and come forward to work with law enforcement. I see. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your professional experience as a prosecutor and your personal experience? Anything that sort of drew you to work in this particular area of law enforcement? Sure. As you mentioned, I grew up in Chinatown. Um, I am a first generation American. And I grew up very close to the office, actually. Yeah. Um, I remember walking by Hogan Place when I went to, as I was walking to um, Stuyvesant High School, where I went to school in Battery Park City. And I was always really curious about the district attorney's office. Never did I imagine one day I'd be able to be a member of the office. Um, since I joined in 2005, I started with the narcotics unit. Um, I learned so much about how to build cases. From the street level narcotics cases, I then went to special investigations. And that's where I worked with the DEA predominantly on wiretap investigations. From there, um, I was very lucky to be one of the inaugural ADAs for Mr. Vance's crime strategies unit, which was a unit where he um, created and he established that five ADAs would cover the county of Manhattan. Wow, and you were one of those five. I was one of the five. And our goal was to make sure we understood crime trends in each of the neighborhoods of Manhattan. And I was lucky enough to cover my area. Um, so from there, I worked a lot with the community, um, but 
between my investigative experience and my community experience, this was a perfect fit to co-chair the um, Immigrant Affairs Unit. Excellent. Um, what sorts of cases does your unit prosecute? So we mostly prosecute individuals who take advantage of immigrants. So they could be lawyers, but what we see the most are fake attorneys or notarios or people who pretend that they have special access or um, special relationships with people in government and they can help these immigrants get whatever benefits they're looking for. So those are most of the cases that we prosecute. I see. Um, <clears throat> can you give us a sense as to the ways in which the immigrant community might be particularly vulnerable to, to being victims of crimes. Right. I think the immigrant experience is very unique and very important to the backbone of our city. But at the same time, if you're undocumented in this country, it's very difficult. And for many undocumented immigrants, if they've become a victim of a crime, it's very, very difficult for them to come forward for a number of reasons. The first is they come from countries where they don't trust their governments. So the last place you're going to go is to report this to a government agency. Another reason why it's very difficult is that many immigrants don't speak English. So you know, even for English speakers, it's very difficult sometimes to understand what the criminal justice system is all about. So if you can imagine, for a non-English speaker, right. the whole experience is just daunting. Third, immigrants really transact a lot in cash. So Carrying a lot of cash, transacting cash, cash is not as easily traceable as, as you know, money orders, checks. So that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, but finally, unscrupulous people take advantage of immigrants because immigrants believe and they want to believe that everything's going to work out in this country. That if they work hard, if they go to the right person to get their papers done, that everything's going to be fine. So unscrupulous people will make promises to them and tell these immigrants what they want to hear. Because immigrants are desperate sometimes for work permits, they will believe what these people say. So there is a sense of belief that sometimes makes immigrants vulnerable to fraud. I see. <clears throat> um, and are there sometimes concerns about their own immigration status and whether or not by reporting this crime as to which they're the victim, somehow they might get themselves in some scrutiny that they might not want. Is that an issue as well? Of course. And I'm so glad you brought that up. That is definitely one of the main obstacles we face whenever we're speaking to an undocumented immigrant. And that's why it's so important for us to do shows like this and to be in the community, to tell the community, we, as the district attorney's office, we are not interested in deporting you. And if you are a victim or a witness in a crime, we are not going to turn your name over to the federal authorities to deport you. We are not interested in that at all. That's so, I'm so glad to hear that, and I think it's important that a lot of people hear that. Mm -hmm. um, do you also, we've been talking about the victims of crimes, do you also work with witnesses uh, to crimes who happen to be immigrants? and? and do you deal with some issues that they face in that regard? Right. And I think we as an entire, we as an office deal with witnesses and victims who are undocumented. Um, and I think our position, and I know our position to undocumented witnesses and victims, if you are a witness or, or a victim, you have every right to come through our doors and report that crime as a witness or as a victim. And you should not be afraid that somehow because of your status, you are going to get deported. Do you work with various agencies outside of the DA's office, both in law enforcement and outside of law enforcement? Absolutely. Um, our relationships with our law enforcement partners are crucial and very important in our prosecution and investigation of these types of cases. So of course, when it's fraud against immigrants, when um, they're filing their immigration papers, we have to work with the Department of Homeland Security, um, specifically the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS. Um, we work with them very frequently, um, as well as Homeland Security Investigations. We also work with the Disciplinary Committee, um, the NYPD, but, um, law enforcement agencies across the board. So, but just as important as our law enforcement partners, though, are our community partners. And, and what role do the community partners play? A lot of the times, undocumented immigrants will not go to law enforcement first. If they've been a victim of a crime, they will go to their local community advocates first.
So it's important for us to build a relationship with our community partners, to let them know what we do, to let them know that they can trust us, to let them know that we're not going to deport these immigrants. Um, so it's really important for us to go out into the community and educate our community partners and advocates. Let's say I'm, I'm a new immigrant to this country and I say to you, well, this sounds terrible. I don't want this to happen to me. What can you suggest to me so that I can avoid being the victim of these crimes? So with the help of um, our community partnership unit, we've created little postcards for um, immigrants and immigrant communities that are passed out in community groups across the county and the city. Um, we have these in multiple languages, in English, Chinese, Korean, French Creole, and of course Spanish. Um, and some of the tips, so the first one, don't pay with cash. Try as much as possible to pay with a check or money order. The second is to always get a receipt. The third is to get and maintain copies of your documents. Fourth is don't sign blank documents or documents that you don't understand. And then the fifth is to verify service providers' credentials and always look for a second opinion. Uh, excellent. Uh, what if it's too late for that advice? I'm now the victim of a crime. Mm -hmm. um, what do I do if I'm an immigrant? Any special suggestions or tips on that? They can always call us. We actually have live people picking up our phones, and our number is 212-335-3600. We have paralegals who answer the phone in multi-languages. Um, but if we can't speak your language, we can always get the AT&T language line on the phone. Terrific. Well, what sort of services does your office offer to people once they get there? Um, I imagine they're not just dealing with a prosecutor, but perhaps they're dealing with other folks who can offer other services? Definitely. We have a very robust witness aid and services unit, which I'm sure Catherine will talk a little bit more about. Um, and um, we just opened the Family Justice Center within the building, so it's very exciting to have so many resources in one place. I see. The, the Manhattan DA's office um, has always been, I think, at the forefront of fighting different sorts of crime and bringing innovative, innovative techniques and approaches to investigating and prosecuting different types of crime. Um, can you tell us uh, ways in which the office has been at the forefront of dealing with issues unique to crimes against immigrants? So as I mentioned previously, the Immigrant Affairs Unit was established in 2007. Now, as you know, immigration is such a hot topic. Um, but we have had this for quite a while now. Um, and I, we were the first unit in the country um, within a DA's office. So that's been very exciting for us. Yeah, that is. What's also been nice, though, is that other counties within the city and outside of the city have now either establish their own immigrant affairs units or are in the process of establishing units. Um, so that is great for us. That's terrific. Um, have you observed any trends or emerging issues with regard to immigrants and the particular challenges they face in this area? Well, whenever there is a new policy initiative or policy directive or change in immigration laws or priorities, um, whenever there's a high profile change, there are always scam artists who try and get ahead of those changes and steal from immigrants. So um, we have been involved in a lot of prevention efforts whenever there are there is a new announcement. For example, when the president recently announced his new executive actions, we've been involved in getting the word out um, on what that is exactly and what it isn't. Excellent. Well, it, it's terrible that this sort of crime exists. It's terrible that people victimize people new to this country here for a new life. Mm -hmm. But it's so good to know that your office and that you are doing what you're doing to help people who deal with these crimes. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to go now to our next guest, uh, and we're going to talk to Catherine Christian about the Elder Abuse Unit at your office. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for being with us, with us on the show. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to CB8 Speaks. As promised, we have our next guest, uh, Catherine Christian. Hello and welcome to our show. Glad to be here. Thank so, you. We're so glad to have you with us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Catherine Christian uh, is chief of the Manhattan DA's office Elder Abuse Unit. By way of Brief background, ADA Christian began her career in the trial division of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, prosecuting a wide variety of crimes, including domestic violence and homicides. She left the DA's office at one point, but went into private practice. Then she served as assistant counsel for the New York State Commission 
of investigation. She then served as a law clerk for the Honorable Rosalind Richter, and then she returned to the Manhattan DA's office in 1998, and she has held several leadership positions until her appointment as Chief of the Elder Abuse Unit. She has studied at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and she was president of the New York County Lawyers Association from 2007 to 2008. It's a real privilege to have you with us. Uh, ADA Christian, I'm going to ask you the, the same question I asked of ADAU. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the role of your unit, the Elder Abuse Unit, uh, and your duties and responsibilities as chief of that unit? Well, primarily, and what's unique about the Elder Abuse Unit Manhattan Day's office is we um, prosecute crimes that involve street crimes against the elderly and financial crimes. And most of the crimes are theft related and they either are theft that are committed by home health care aides or theft committed by people who are part of their family or there's physical abuse by family members which we classify as domestic violence or just regular street crimes that happen where a person is targeted because they are elderly and we define elderly in the Manhattan Days office is anyone 60 and older. So if you're a victim of a crime age 60 and older, you would fall within um, a crime that we would oversee in the elder abuse unit. I see. And um, can you tell us about what about your experience sort of drew you to this particular area of, of law enforcement? Well, what's interesting, when I started in the DA's office, as you mentioned years ago, I was a domestic violence assistant. And at that time, um, any crime whether it was against someone who was elderly or someone who was younger that fall within the <clears throat> domestic violence unit. And my interest in crimes against the elderly actually happened in private practice. Um, during that period in the, the, the 90s, there was a subprime mortgage crisis. And we found that there were a number of unscrupulous mortgage brokers that were targeting elderly people, convincing them to take reverse mortgages or convincing them to refinance their homes into um, interest rates that were balloon mortgages and they needed attorneys and in private practice we were asked pro to do it pro bono and we just saw that these and many of them there were women um, who were you know had pensions and they were able to have a home who were losing their home and subjected to foreclosure because they were victimized financially um, by people and that's when I saw that the elderly were being targeted and that to be given an opportunity when I came back to be a prosecutor to prosecute people who are victimizing um, our most uh, precious citizens was a um, really an honor for me. You mentioned that some people target the elderly. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why the elderly are so particularly vulnerable to be targeted? While we all know older people who are 80 who are sharp as attack mentally, the reality is that as we age, our cognitive abilities are decreased, particularly our financial management skills. And so you have a group of people who, because they're older, they are not as aware as they were when they were younger, who may actually be suffering from disease dementia, also, quite frankly, older people have, in some cases, significant assets. They have pensions. Um, they have equity in their homes. So they're a prime target for people who would take advantage of them. I see. What sort of penalties can someone face for preying on the elderly? It depends on the crime. Actually, in New York, we have enhanced penalties for certain types of crime that are committed against elderly. If you're a caregiver, a home health care aide, or someone else who has been entrusted with the responsibility for taking care of an elderly person, and while they're in your care, you uh, commit a crime against them, uh, physically injure them, that is an enhanced penalty. Um, if you uh, do a scheme to the fraud against people, which is basically you conspire and uh, to commit fraud against a group of people. If one of those people is elderly, a vulnerable elderly person, that penalty is enhanced. But we have the entire um, penal law of crimes that we will prosecute to the fullest extent if the person is 60 years or older. And we will ask for, if, if justice requires, an appropriate penalty. 
In terms of investigating and prosecuting crimes against the elderly, do you face unique challenges with regard to the elderly? Well, one of the challenges I mention is cognitive impairment. Uh, A number of times there are people who, because of their inability to remember, they don't know what happened, they're not aware, so we have to build a case with other evidence, particularly in financial crimes. We have to, you know, we look for flags. This person who is 65 years old or 70 years old who lives in the West Village, would they really be going to an ATM machine at 3 o'clock in the morning in Brownsville, Brooklyn? So we, we try to get, you know, as many other witnesses as we can. In some cases, most um, of the victims of crime who are elderly, the perpetrator are people who they know, mm-hmm. either a family member or an entrusted home health care aide. So what you have is the elderly person is, you know, sympathetic. You know, they don't want to, you know, uh, prosecute or assist with the prosecution against a family member. Um, or they fear retaliation. Uh, You know, sometimes the perpetrators of the crime, particularly this family member, will threaten to put them in a nursing home or other threats that are unfounded. So we have to face that a lot. Let's say I say to you, um, I want to avoid being the victim of a crime like this, or I have a loved one who's an elderly person and they want to avoid being the victim of Mm -hmm. elder abuse. Do you have any uh, tips that you would give someone like that? The elderly, as we all are, are victims of identity theft and scams. What I would say, particularly to older people, you get a phone call, never ever give out personal identifying information about yourself to anyone on the phone. If you didn't initiate the phone call to your bank, to your credit card company, do not give out a personal information. If you get a phone call saying you've won a lottery or you've won a sweepstakes that you did not enter, I always say when I go to senior centers, hang up, it's not true. Um, the New York State Lottery, they will tell you that they don't know who's won the lottery unless the person shows up with the ticket and says, I have the winning numbers. So it is false. So it's just be very careful about when you get those phone calls or those emails, those unsolicited emails. Just never, ever give out personal information unless you do the initiating. That's, that's good advice. Um, what agencies do you work with outside of the DA's office to investigate and prosecute elder abuse? The, well, there's the New York State and New York City Department of Aging, Adult Protective Services. These are agencies that are dedicated to assisting the elderly with their needs, particularly the New York City Department of Aging. If you um, need meals, City Meals on Wheels, if you um, having, if you're a grandparent who is raising a grandchild and you're having issues with that grandchild, you can call the Department of Aging. We all work together, um, the service providers in the DA's office, because frequently the phone calls we get do not involve a crime. It re- involves a referral, and so we will refer um, the elderly person to a, another city agency or legal services if it's an issue involving a civil matter. So we, we meet frequently together and we work together. And we, we've spoken about a broad range of crimes um, against the elderly from the financial crimes, identity theft, um, also I imagine physical abuse. Physical abuse, neglect. Neglect. Um, and you mentioned also that sometimes the perpetrators, more often than not, are people known yes. to the elderly person, the victim. Um, what role? Can you tell us what an order of protection is and what role that plays in your efforts to, to well, deal with this? An order of protection is a court order. It's typically in a case where the uh, parties are known to each other. We hear it in a domestic violence context, but that happens also in the elder abuse context. If it's a grandchild, a niece or nephew, or someone who the elderly person knows. Uh, the court directs that person to stay away and to stop, um, you know, going to, that includes emails, visiting, calling, um, contacting that elderly person. And it could be during the course of the prosecution and thereafter. Um, it's a piece of paper um, in reality, but it is that order that that person has, that victim, where they can call the police and say, you know, this person was not supposed to call me, was not supposed to knock on my door, and the police will come, and if that person is there, there is an additional charge that will happen, criminal contempt, because that person has now violated a court order. So now they will be prosecuted again for a separate charge for the violation of that court order. You know, we had another show where we talked about domestic violence, and one of the things we talked about is how domestic violence affects all walks of life, all levels of socioeconomic 
um, position. Um, what about elder abuse? The same. I, you know, when I speak to groups, I will say, and it's, and I usually have everyone, everyone will raise their hand. Everyone in this room um, either is related to someone or knows someone who's been a victim of elder abuse, either financial fraud or physical abuse. Whether you're a, an elderly woman who lives on a modest pension in Mitchell Lama Housing, or you live on Sutton Place or somewhere on the Upper West, Upper West Side. Um, it doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Um, you can be victimized, particularly in the financial area. I see. And let's say that uh, I or someone I care about is the victim of elder abuse. What suggestions do you have in terms of dealing with it? If it's physical danger, obviously immediately call 911. But in terms of the Manhattan DA's office, we have an elder abuse hotline, which is confidential. So you don't have to give your name. Um, if you do give your name, we don't give it over. Um, we investigate it. And if, if it's not a crime, as I said, we will refer you to a different agency. Um, in some cases, we will handle it ourselves. Your, your, um, Rosemary, you who spoke earlier, we have a witness aid services unit, which um, we're unique in the Manhattan DA's office because we don't have to refer out a lot. If you need help getting bene veterans benefits or you're having an issue understanding documents, we have social workers and uh, psychologists um, on staff who can help our witnesses, even if they turn out not to be, it turns out not to be a crime we can prosecute. So um, we can help in all different ways. That's great. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for being on the show with us. These two issues that we've discussed, the abuse of the elderly, the abuse of immigrants, as you mentioned, they touch all walks mm -hmm. of life and they affect our community, they affect our city, they affect our nation. Um, our goal on this show is to try to focus attention on important issues. This mm -hmm. These both are very important issues. And uh, I hope that in some small way, if we've conveyed information to the victims of elder abuse or the victims of uh, the abuse of immigrants, I hope we've accomplished that. And we're so grateful to you um, and to your office and to ADAU for everything you're doing uh, to protect people, to deter people from committing these crimes, to investigating these crimes and prosecuting them as vigorously as, as we know that you do. Uh, we thank you for that and we, we thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much for the opportunity.